The long history of America's desert southwest tells of richly varied and interwoven humanity, Native Americans, Spanish missionaries, and pioneer settlers. Their convergence in this arid yet beautiful place has created an environment that's at once historic and timeless. I'm Bill Boggs, following the paths where the people of these ancient pueblos, towns, and missions met and mixed over the centuries. All places worth exploring for every historic traveler. Our journey across the tapestry of southwestern history begins with one of New Mexico's earliest civilizations, We'll visit the remains of an Anasazi Indian Pueblo at the Aztec Ruins National Monument. From there, we head south to the center of Spanish colonization in the area at Santa Fe. And we'll end with the graceful melding of the two cultures at the picturesque San Javier del Bac Mission in Tucson, Arizona. Carefully worked stone rises out of the New Mexican Mesa. Finely cut blocks form the halls and rooms that comprise a large planned community. We know who built this place, but how and why and where they came from are lost in time. Visitors to the Aztec Ruins National Monument today can experience the haunting beauty of these tumbled walls and learn all that modern archaeology has been able to deduce about the natives who built them. But in the end, you'll find that the mystery of the place endures. The ruins are conveniently located right across the Animas River from the quaint historic town of Aztec, New Mexico. Although Aztec is a small town, it's taken great pains to preserve as much of its past as possible. The Aztec Museum and Pioneer Village includes Indian artifacts, an original frontier cabin, and the town's first jail. At the Step Back Inn, each room is named for one of the town's founding families, making it a charming and historic hotel for your visit to Aztec. Although it's called the Aztec Ruins, park ranger Grady Griffith says the name only underscores how little those first Anglo settlers knew about the previous inhabitants. Well, when the early settlers moved into the Animas River Valley, they thought that this structure was built by the Aztecs of Mexico. However, it was built by the Anasazi, the ancestral people of the Pueblo today. Uh, it did take a great deal of organization, manpower, and obviously food to feed the people. Uh, but the Aztec Empire of Mexico uh, rose and fell centuries before the Anasazi built this structure. Anasazi was a name used by the Navajo living here when the white man arrived and means ancient ones. The Anasazi themselves left no written record of their lives. The Aztec ruin complex includes at least two major structures and several smaller sites. Only the West Ruin has been thoroughly excavated and is open to the public. Modern dating of the timbers shows the West Ruin was built all at once starting in the year 1111. But where the builders came from is uncertain. They may have come north from the Chaco Canyon or they may have been local Indians influenced by the Chaco people. This artist's sketch shows how the village may have looked in its heyday. Almost 450 rooms rise to three stories in some places. They surround a large central plaza dominated by a large sunken ceremonial room called a kiva. This plaza may look plain enough, but it's actually yielded a solution to one of Aztec's puzzles. In 1916, an archaeologist named Earl Morris began digging here. And under this plaza, he discovered two distinct layers of very different kinds of pottery. His conclusion, that there had been two separate periods of ancient occupation. First, the builders who worked in the style of the Chaco Canyon Indians to the south. Then a different pottery style showed that after a 70-year vacancy, the village was taken over by a new group of Anastasi with ties to the Mesa Verde people from the north. Well, archaeologists think today that no more than two, two or three hundred people actually lived within the structure at any one time. Many of the rooms were used for storage, 
just as we use our, our garages or storage sheds today. Uh, a virtual gold mine for archaeologists. And these are some of the things that came from that site. But for the Anasazi, perhaps the most important rooms in the complex were the ceremonial kivas. There are more than a dozen kivas near Aztec used for a yearly round of rituals and observances. In the 1930s, archaeologist Earl Morris began a complete reconstruction of the Great Kiva at the center of the West Ruin. Well, Morris reconstructed it in 1934. Uh, he built the upper rooms, the 15 upper smaller rooms. Uh, he said in the excavation that he found nothing to indicate the use of those rooms. Uh, we don't know what they're used for even today. Uh, the four massive pillars supported a roof uh, that weighed probably 95 tons. Um, the four limestone discs came from at least 40 miles away, weighing to about 400 pounds each, um, with no wheeled vehicles or horses. It was quite a chore. It showed that it was, uh, this structure was very important to the community. Uh, what that importance was, we're not sure. Another ceremonial mystery the Anasazi left behind are the network of roads crisscrossing the entire region. Perhaps they were used for trade or pilgrimage. Perhaps the roads were symbolic or religious rather than practical. We may never know. Around the year 1300, the Anasazi may have put these roadways to one final use. For no apparent reason, they suddenly abandoned not only the Aztec region, but this entire section of New Mexico as well. Scientists have been unable to offer any conclusive explanation for their departure or their destination. Without the written word, only the remnants of stone paths and buildings can speak for the Anasazi today. Our trip through southwestern history now turns to the early influence of Spain at Santa Fe, New Mexico. Santa Fe's colorful central plaza is the heart of the town. It's the focus of the city's exciting cultural cross currents and the perfect starting point for your exploration. In just a few hours, you can take a walking tour through 300 years of Santa Fe's history, all within a few blocks of this bustling city park. The original name of the city was La Via Real de la Santa Fe de San Francisco de Assis the royal town of the holy faith of St. Francis. You can see why they changed it to Santa Fe. Your first stop should be this graceful adobe building bordering the plaza. It's the oldest structure in town. In fact, it's the oldest continuously used public building in the entire country. Known as the Palace of the Governors, it was built at the town's founding in 1610, a decade before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. Today, the Governor's Palace is a first-class museum of New Mexico's history. Museum Associate Director Charles Bennett says the building first served as home and office to Spain's colonial governors and officials. Well, Bill, one of the first things that the uh, Spanish colonists did upon arrival here in the uh, Santa Fe area is put the uh, local Indians to work uh, doing uh, various and sundry tasks. Uh, one of the more important tasks that they uh, had to do was, uh, of course, plow the fields and uh, plant crops right away. Uh, they also uh, wove uh, textiles, different type of textiles. Charles, where did the artifacts in this room actually come from? Well, actually, Bill, uh, most of the artifacts you see displayed here in this room were excavated in this room from uh, various subsurface excavations that you can see uh, through trap doors here, including this one over here to my left, which is a storage pit dug by the Pueblo Indians when they occupied the building for 12 years uh, during what we call the Great Pueblo uh, Revolt. Uh, 1680 to 1692 when the uh, Indians living in this area rose in revolt and actually expelled the Spanish from what is today New Mexico to El Paso, Texas. After 13 years in exile, the Spanish reclaimed Santa Fe in a bloodless siege in 1692. These weapons date from the era of cooperation that soon followed as the Pueblo Indians and the Spanish fought side by side against invading Indians from the Great Plains. Also in the museum is a room dressed just as it was when the U.S. territorial governors used it as an office. In 1878, um, the President of the United States appointed Lew Wallace, the governor of New Mexico Territory. Lew Wallace was probably one of our more colorful territorial governors. Uh, he was appointed 
uh, in response to widespread lawlessness and corruption here in New Mexico territory. Uh, he even had a few run-ins with Billy the Kid, one of our more infamous uh, outlaws here in New Mexico. Uh, but most of his time was spent in a room here in the Palace of the Governors, much like this room that we're standing in, Bill, uh, working on his novel that you've probably heard of, Ben-Hur. Across the plaza from the Palace of Governors is literally the end of the trail, specifically the Santa Fe Trail. After Mexico declared its independence from Spain in 1821, American merchants opened the first major western trade route from Missouri to Santa Fe. Soon, Santa Fe was a destination for trappers, traders, and settlers of every kind, all tired, dusty, and needing a place to stay. They'd ride up to the end of the trail, and this is what they'd find, La Fonda, Spanish for the inn. Although this building dates only to 1919, there's been an inn on this spot since the town was founded. And with its striking mountain views and distinctive hand-painted furniture, La Fonda is still a fine place to stay almost 400 years later. With its long history, La Fonda has hosted many important people over the centuries, including President James K. Polk, Generals Sherman and Grant, and one man crucial to Santa Fe's history, Archbishop John Baptiste Lamy. To see Lamy's influence in stone and mortar, just walk across the street from La Fonda to the St. Francis Cathedral. The cathedral's French Romanesque architecture stands in clear contrast to the low adobe structures that surround it. Each of the two towers that flank the main church was planned to support a 160-foot steeple, but those plans were never fulfilled. On the north side of the cathedral stands a chapel, which was built especially to house New Mexico's most venerated figure of the Virgin Mary. Known as La Conquistadora, this wooden statue arrived with monks in the early 1600s and has been worshipped on this spot since the reconquest in 1692. Another powerful sculpture found at St. Francis Cathedral is this likeness of Archbishop Lamy himself. Not only was he the driving force behind this cathedral, but Lamy also oversaw the building of 45 more churches and a handful of parochial schools throughout the territory. Another of the Archbishop's legacies can be seen just two blocks from the cathedral. It's the Loretto Chapel and it has a remarkable story. The construction of the chapel was started in 1873 for the Sisters of Loretto and dedicated to St. Joseph. But when the building was finished, the sisters realized a horrible mistake had been made. The builders had included a wonderful choir loft, but had left out any stairway leading up to it. Carpenters were called in, but none could devise a solution in the limited space. Then one day, as the story goes, an old man with a donkey and a tool chest came to the mother superior and asked if he could try. Working with just a hammer, a saw, and a carpenter's T-square, this is what he built. This masterpiece of carpentry was built without a single nail. There is no supporting pole up the middle, and scientists have been unable to identify the wood used. How this could have been done by one old man with primitive tools in the 1870s, no one knows. But more than one believer has suggested that it was St. Joseph himself, in person, who answered the sisters' prayers for access to their loft. The final stop on our tour through the Old Southwest may be the oldest continuously inhabited city in the U.S., Tucson, Arizona. Tucson today is a vibrant, fast-growing metropolitan area ringed by the rugged mountains and deserts of southern Arizona. But in the shadow of the downtown skyscrapers, centuries of history lie mostly buried beneath a neighborhood known as El Presidio. El Presidio means the fort. It refers to the 12-acre walled enclosure built here in 1775 to protect the Spanish colonists from hostile Apaches. The original Presidio included a chapel, cemetery, stables, and quarters for officers, soldiers, and settlers. The 12-foot-high walls were torn down long ago, but 
This black granite strip outside the Pima County Courthouse shows you exactly where the wall's foundations lie, eight feet below the ground. El Presidio is also the name of a delightful bed and breakfast that you might use as the headquarters for a visit here. Built in 1886, after the coming of the railroad to Tucson, this Victorian home represents just one of a wide variety of architectural styles in the Presidio Historic District, ranging from Spanish colonial to prairie style. Other sites of historic interest in the Presidio District include this monument near City Hall to the Jesuit missionary who first colonized the area for Spain in 1691. In addition to the Holy Catholic faith, Father Eusebio Quino brought cattle, horses, and crops to the place the natives call Chetuxon, a name the Spanish took up as Tucson. But Father Quino's most impressive memorial can be found 15 miles southwest of town. That monument is not a statue or a plaque, but the Mission San Javier del Bac, which he founded in 1692. Today, the church welcomes thousands of visitors each year. It's considered the finest standing example of mission architecture anywhere in the United States. Dr. Jim Griffith says the present magnificent structure went up about a century after Father Kino's arrival. And until recently, the name of the architect remained a mystery. Contemporary thinking says that it probably was a Spanish architect named Ignacio Gaona, and he was working in the mainstream of the colonial Spanish Baroque, and that's where you get this wonderful, detailed, three-tiered facade with all the stuff going on on it. One unique aspect of the mission's design is the colorful interior. Virtually every surface in the church is brightly painted. Well, it painted everything. If it wasn't moving, it got painted. And the reason is that in urban Mexico, there would have been oil paintings and tiles. We're up on the frontier. They didn't have those things, so they painted them on. And some of the paintings uh, have painted frames around them and painted ribbons hanging them from painted nails. Unfortunately, San Javier del Bac was not always so lovingly cared for through its life. After Mexican independence from Spain, the Mexican government expelled all Spanish priests in 1827, and San Javier was abandoned. Tradition has it that many of the portable items and statues were taken by the Indians into their homes for safekeeping. Birds took up nesting in Christ's crown of thorns. After southern Arizona became U.S. territory almost 30 years later, Tucson became part of Bishop Lamy's diocese headquartered in Santa Fe. Under the bishop's attention, things really started picking up here. Priests visited San Javier more frequently, and sisters built a school out here, or started a school in this building right here, which incidentally is the 1750s edition of San Javier, picked up, moved around the corner, and reassembled brick by brick, stick by stick. Still, time had taken its toll on San Javier del Bac. The dilapidated old mission would have to be either saved or eventually demolished. Luckily, in 1900, del Bac became the responsibility of Bishop Henry Grandjean, who made it his mission to save this mission. He threw himself into repairing and restoring the historic compound, using his own money and often working side by side with the laborers. By 1907, this luminous treasure had been restored to its former glory. This beautiful new archway would become known as Grandjean's Gate. And with a new coat of whitewash, Mission San Javier del Bac would become known as the White Dove of the Desert. Tracing this route through Southwest history takes about four days. But if you like the Aztec ruins, at a stop to Anasazi site Bandelier National Monument, off Route 4, about an hour from Santa Fe. Las Vegas, New Mexico, two hours east of Santa Fe, offers Civil War history at Fort Union. There are history demonstrations there in summer, and the Theodore Roosevelt Rough Riders Memorial and Museum is close by, a reminder of the Spanish-American War. 
The American Southwest is unique. Like a cook stewing a pot of chili, the forces of history have blended influences of Native American, Spanish, and eventually Yankee culture. After three centuries of simmering, the spicy, flavorful result is right here, ready for you to enjoy. I'm Bill Boggs. Thanks for joining me on Historic Traveler.